All right, so let's talk aluminium. Aluminium is a natural occurring element. Uh, it was discovered in 1825, and it was named aluminium, and it was named that way to rhyme with other metals. So magnesium, titanium, aluminium, all had that nice eum sound at the end. Uh, early 1900s here in the States, we uh, misprinted it a couple of times, couldn't really figure out how to pronounce it, and after a while threw up our hands and said, ah, screw it, we'll say it however we feel like. So everywhere else in the world, aluminium here in the States, aluminum, right? So, uh, as far as building things with it, commercially pure, about as pure as you can get aluminium is 1100 series, right? Most of the early uh, race cars and super leger cars, alloy cars, um, they were built with commercially pure aluminium, 1100, uh, magnesium, things like that. Um, and it's amazing, it has a real high sheen, it's easily manipulated, it's malleable, it's workable, it has good corrosion resistance, um, it's weldable by all processes, it's just really, really awesome to work with. But it's so soft all of the things that make it great means that the vintage cars some of the early ones man you breathe on them and they just dent right so uh 1100 series is fantastic but we thought you know what we need all of those really really good qualities so what can we do to make it stronger so we started adding different things to it we started adding different elements to the aluminium alloy and Lo and behold, some interesting things happen. So to clarify, you can uh, heat treat this aluminium if it has certain elements with it. Um, and then some aluminiums cannot be heat treated. So uh, the next step up and what's probably the most used aluminium in the world today for all different kinds of applications. And it's also what I use, what other coach builders use. Basically, anybody who's building a car or restoring a car is going to use 3003 series. So 3003 series is aluminium that's almost commercially pure, but uh, it's created with a little bit of manganese. And the manganese gives it uh, a little bit more rigidity, a little bit more strength, uh, a little bit more resistance to fatigue wear. So it doesn't change any of the other properties. It's very, very easily formed. Uh, it's weldable by all processes. Uh, it doesn't really work hard and good corrosion resistance. Uh, all of the things we like about the commercially pure stuff, but it's a little bit stronger. Now when I say a little bit stronger, uh, stronger than just super, super soft aluminum, but not like in a way that you would want for something that has a lot of stresses on it or needs uh, to be very, very structural, okay? So just by adding that, uh, the little bit of manganese, that gives us what we're looking for. So then there's other applications where we need things to be a little bit stronger, but when you start messing with the alloys um, and adding different things to them, then it also changes some of the good properties that we have about it. So. Next one on the list, 5052. Uh, 5052 aluminium, uh, this one is used primarily for anything food grade. Um, it's going to be anything that has, uh, that's anywhere close to like seawater, uh, anything marine, boats, uh, stuff like that. Uh, I use it for fuel cells, different things like that. And the reason why is because it has great corrosion resistance, right? Uh, very, very strong. Uh, it has a couple of different alloys in it that give it these properties and it's um, it's really really uh, Has really good fatigue wear and it's also resistant to microbial growth So if you're familiar with like fuel cells or aircraft or things like that microbial growth uh, is something that uh, That we have to fight right and essentially microbial growth is like uh, Exactly what it sounds like right microbiotic uh, Growth organic growth that can happen sometimes in places where it's dark where there's moisture different things like that so um, in the case of fuel cells, uh, we don't want stuff growing and like kind of getting uh, into our fuel systems or any kind of liquid system that we have, right? So 5052, marine, uh, microbial growth, corrosion control, uh, food grade, fatigue strength, um, and it can be easily welded. You can weld it with TIG or uh, acetylene welded, so on and so forth. Uh, but because of the different uh, alloys that are in it, it's not as workable. It is workable but it's not the kind of thing where you could just like keep hammering it and shaping it and moving it around. Uh, eventually it'll work hard and then start to get a, a little bit more uh, stress in those little areas, right? Um, and it doesn't move as easy. So in theory, if you're building like a, like a panel that has like some light bins in it, perfectly fine. Uh, fuel cell that's got bead rolling in it, perfectly fine. If you wanna build a full fender, you're probably gonna wanna go back to that 3003 or 1100 series, okay? So from there, we are talking about different structures like uh, aerospace structures, right? We're gonna say, let's send something out of the Earth's atmosphere. It needs to go uh, over a thousand miles an hour and we need it to be very, very, very strong. So 
Uh, aluminium is very light. That's one of the things we love about it. How do we make it stronger? And uh, what happens when we change those properties? Okay, so 2024. Uh, 2024, the main uh, alloying element is uh, copper. So when you add copper to the aluminium, uh, it makes quite a few changes to it. So uh, 2024, you generally see in like aviation and aerospace, it's very strong, it's very light, uh, it's stiffer, um, but adding the copper makes it a non-weldable alloy. So 2024 is classified as non-weldable. So if you weld it, uh, you'll be able to lay down normal welds, it'll look completely fine, but what happens is anywhere you weld, that's gonna crack and break. Um, and so the caveat to that is that it can be uh, friction welded, spot welded in very, very controlled and precise environments, right? As in, like you have to have a digital spot welder that can spot weld uh, and you can control the heat up, the cool down, the whole deal. And even then, uh, it has to go through pretty strenuous uh, NDI, non-destructive uh, inspection or NDT, non-destructive uh, testing to make sure that it's structural. And even then it tends to be kind of a weak spot. So it's not used very often. So uh, the other thing is the copper makes it uh, less resistant to corrosion. So sometimes you'll see clad, you'll get uh, aluminum that either says clad or all clad. And essentially what that is, is it's a really thin layer of commercially pure aluminum, 1100 series, uh, on the outside that kind of encases the whole thing. So if you drill holes in it or scratch that clad or at any time that is opened up, then those areas are more prone to corrosion. So it's much more important that you have a good process for protecting that. So like acid etch and aladine or uh, epoxy primers or, or like zinc chromates or things like that. So you see it uh, anywhere that it's... Uh, it's something that needs to be very strong and rigid and light. Um, it can be shaped and formed and moved around, but not very well. So for instance, uh, I've built some sub-assemblies in my career where it was made out of uh, 2024 uh, and it was annealed to make it a little softer and then you would shape it to what you needed and then send it out and have it heat treated uh, to like a T3 or T4 condition, which brings it back to that nice brittle, not brittle, but you know what I mean, strong uh, uh, temperament. Um, but even in its annealed state, it's not very formable. You can do a little bit to it, but it, it won't take much. Um, so 2024, uh, non-weldable, uh, not very good corrosion resistance compared to the other ones. Very strong, very light, uh, typically used for aviation, aerospace, things like that. Yep. So uh, well now we're going to get into uh, one of the big ones. It's one of the cheapest ones to make, actually, um, and it's used all over the place in aerospace applications. It's kind of that middle ground. It's between like uh, 3003 and 7075, which we'll get to. Uh, it's strong and stiff and rigid and handles fatigue, but you can still weld it. All right, so essentially in aerospace, anytime you see uh, aluminum component that needs to be welded, almost always it's 6061. So 6061 can be heat treated. It can be heat treated to different uh, uh, hardnesses and it's also a weldable aluminum. So it's cheap to make, uh, it's weldable, so you can have it on like sub-assemblies where joints aren't uh, connected with mechanical fasteners. Um, it can be machined, it can be extruded, it's very, very versatile. Um, so 6061 is aluminum, manganese, and silicon. So if you're noticing a pattern here, basically each of the aluminum uh, alloys that you can buy that are used commercially, they have different things added to them and each thing creates different properties for it, right? Uh, and I'm not even touching on every single alloy. There's so many different commercial alloys of aluminum that are used in so many different things. Uh, some of them are just hybrids where they're kind of like in the middle, right? Um, some of the, the, like in the 50s series, like the 50s and the 80s, 50s, 80s, um, those are kind of like middle ground ones, right? So I'm kind of going through the basics so you understand. So the 6061 is very strong. Uh, it's easily machined. It's kind of like right in that sweet spot of structural aluminum where it can be strong. It can uh, have fatigue resistance. It can be uh, machined. It can be heat treated, but it can also be welded because generally when you get to the ones that are very hard, very stiff, very strong, they're not workable and they're not weldable. Okay. So 6061, weldable, machinable, extrudable, heat treatable, and generally seen for any application in aerospace where things need to be welded. You also see it a lot in things like, um, uh, I believe the new trucks, the new trucks where they say it's military grade aluminum. 
They're talking about 6061. You see it in a lot of military stuff. So 7075. 7075 is one of the very, very strong alloys. So the key ingredient on this one is zinc. So 7075, uh, it's typically seen on like flight critical things. Um, wing spars, you see it machined in uh, like tubs and uh, stringers, longitudinal, stuff like that. It's very, very strong. Uh, good fatigue resistance, uh, good corrosion resistance. You can get it in the clad that we discussed. Um, but as you've seen, anytime you get these uh, alloys that are, are much stronger, um, this is a non-weldable alloy and it's not very malleable. You can't form it uh, very much. So it's a heat treatable alloy. Um, you see it in like T6 conditions quite a bit. Um, and so the aluminum that they use for this stuff is when you, they're looking for something that needs to be very, very strong, right? So essentially when you're looking for something that's going to take the place of steel or stainless or titanium or whatever, and you need something very, very light. Um, so 7075T6 uh, is real common for aerospace stuff. So that being said, we've talked about a bunch of different alloys. Um, and so now we need to kind of talk about what comes up, or at least in my line of work, maybe some of yours. Um, and one of those things is welding it, right? So uh, welding aluminum, you can do it two different ways. Well, three different ways. Uh, you can uh, MIG weld it with a spool gun, uh, which you see that a lot of manufacturing, right? So like uh, bleachers and like stuff like that, uh, substructures, jigs, frameworks. Um, you see that stuff, uh, trailers, those are usually uh, MIG welded with a spool gun. Um, TIG welding is also, is usually the choice. Um, and so in terms of the kind of work that we do, shaping, metal shaping and building cars and so on and so forth, um, TIG welding is normally what we use, but there's one very, very important thing that we have to remember. When you weld steel, uh, essentially, and dress it down, metal finish the weld seam, uh, it's still very strong in that area as long as you weld it properly uh, with the proper heat and cool down procedures. We talked about that in my welding video, right? So when you weld aluminum uh, with a TIG welder that way and dress it down, dress the weld seams down, uh, it's prone to cracking unless you weld the back side of it. So you have to weld the outside of the seam and then go back on the inside, weld the inside of the seam, and then you can dress it down and it's going to be strong enough, um, which is fine. But sometimes you don't have back access to get in there and weld the back side. So uh, acetylene welding, welding with a gas torch, um, is a different process. You basically weld, you use filler wire just like a TIG welder, but you use flux. And the flux kind of helps carry the weld in through the metal. So it penetrates in a different kind of way. It almost like back welds itself um, as you're going along, right? Um, so that's how uh, aluminum stuff was welded like on cars and aircraft back in the day. Um, it's much, much slower than TIG welding. Uh, but it's very, very helpful. So say you're making like a uh, aluminum fuel cell for a motorcycle. Uh, if you gas weld it, then you don't have to try and weld it from the inside or like do the ship in a bottle type sequence. Um, and you can just put boiling water in there afterwards to clean all the flux out, so on and so forth. But uh, with today's cars and the paint processes, sometimes flux gets trapped in uh, little areas here or there. Uh, aluminum has a relatively open grain, right? And that can cause issues in the paint later. So you don't see aluminum welding on uh, cars and stuff like that as often. One, because people don't really know how to do it. And two, uh, like I said, there are some other issues that go along with it, right? Um, so that brings us to another thing. Aluminum is porous, and so it contains, uh, the grain is much looser, and it can get stuff from its environment. So like people will bring you things like uh, intake manifolds or what have you, things from like the engine bay. And because of that, if there's like hydraulic fluid or gas or oil or anything like that, that stuff can get impregnated in the aluminum itself, right? So sometimes somebody will bring me something, they'll say, hey, can you weld up my intake for me? And uh, my response is always maybe. And the reason why is because I, know, I need to know what the alloy is. I, the grade of the, uh, the cast has to be good enough um, and it can't be too contaminated, right? I used to weld up these assemblies that were uh, alumin and, uh, aluminum that had been clear anodized. And so you can blast the anodize off, but you can never get it all the way out. So what you would have to do for it to be able to pass uh, quality control would weld it, dress it, weld it, let that anodized stuff that was remaining in there cook out, dress it, do that two or three times, and then after that it would usually get through uh, um, your inspections, right? Um, so there's a lot of different things to think about with, uh, with aluminum and the different processes. So that takes us to kind of the summation of uh, aluminum and what you need to know before you build or shape with it, right?
Okay, so the biggest thing with aluminium uh, that I would uh, advise people, the biggest problems that you run into is aluminium appears to be easier to shape, appears to be easier to work. Uh, the welds are aesthetically very pleasing, um, but the biggest problem is um, there's more to it than steel, right? And the, if, if you don't know something, you're ignorant of the fact that you're ignorant of the fact, right? So that's, that's the problem. Like, so uh, understanding the different alloys, what can be done to them, how they're used, uh, what the best choice of alloy is for something specific, that's really the key to working with aluminium, right? And it's not just amateurs. Uh, I've worked in environments where I dealt with highly educated people, engineers, different things, and sometimes when you're thinking about stuff, you have to take all of that into account, right? So sometimes you'd be in a situation where you're like, oh, I'm going to build this and I need this structural capacity, but I need to weld it. And you're like, oh, I'm going to use that. And then you're like, ah, shit, I forgot. That's a non-weldable alloy. Or you're trying to make something out of like 70, 75, and you're like, oh, I need this bend radius in it. And then you're like, ah, oh, I forgot. It can't take that tight of a bend radius. It'll crack, right? So um, I always encourage people, I like I mentioned the last time, I get the irony, but don't just educate yourself off of videos on the internet, right? Like, there's plenty of information about the different alloys and, and what they can do and what they can't do. Because what you don't want to do is be someone who's like, oh yeah, I can totally weld that up or I'm going to build that. And then you do it and then uh, maybe you welded a non-weldable alloy and you had no idea and you sent it out the door and it was no good. Or maybe you just weren't sure how a process should work or you, know, you built something and you're like, hey, I'm like trying to make this like shape and I don't, I don't understand why the metal keeps... Uh, cracking or, or getting like that and you're building it with the wrong or say you build something out of 1100 series and it needs much more structure than that right so the key with aluminium is uh, understand the different alloys how they're made what each one is specifically for and which one is best for the application that you're doing and then two educate yourself so you understand how you can uh, put things together right can it be welded does it need to go to better go together with uh, mechanical fasteners uh, if so, uh, is there a problem with uh, galvanic corrosion or dissimilar metals or different things, right? So just knowing what you're doing will make you a, a thoughtful and a better builder because instead of guessing or working from limited information, you're drawing from lots of information. And I say that a lot, you'll probably hear that with videos, is um, the more information you know about things, different processes, right? It's not just about cutting and welding and hitting stuff with hammers. We have to understand how uh, different uh, energy loads transfer through things. We have to understand uh, the shortest distance between multiple lines. We have to understand what are the best industry standards for things, right? Especially when you're building high-end cars. Like, you can't just build a car that costs the same as a Ferrari and just be throwing stuff against the wall and not know whether it, you know it's correct or not, right? Like You have to be a professional, and it's kind of the the thing that makes it easier to be efficient is knowledge right so aluminium wonderful stuff to work with uh i've built a ton of super legera cars over the years i love aluminium cars um but the key is understand what you're working with make sure you know what that alloy is and what it can do before you start doing stuff hopefully you guys enjoyed this and found this informative um any questions comments uh, leave them for me in the comments, talk to me on my Instagram, whatever. Uh, I don't always get the chance to get back to everybody personally, but I do get that feedback. It, it gets to me and I'm able to uh, respond to it. If I get a, a bunch of questions about one specific thing, it allows me to kind of tailor this content, this information to you guys. So uh, yeah, let me know what you're thinking about. Let me know your thoughts about the aluminium. Uh, thanks for coming along for the ride. I will see you guys next time. Cheers.